Thank you very much. Uh, I've been playing around with words for a long time, and, and uh, I think when I was a kid, one of my, one of my, I wasn't that athletic, and I wasn't that, you know, smart in, in, in various ways, but I could always go home and memorize a couple of words, so I would learn words like apathetic and different things like that, which, you know, for the third grader was a lot of fun. Um, and, and as I got to be an older person, I got really fascinated by doing some tricks with words. One of my favorite uh, exercises was one time I was, when my kids were young, I want, you know, they, 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 they worshiped the Guinness Book of World Records. And um, in those days, in order to get in the Guinness Book, you had to either eat a bicycle or push a peanut across Iowa with your nose to get in the Guinness Book. And I, when I, I was looking at the Guinness Book, and I came upon the word that had the most meanings in English, which was set, S-E-T, down in verb. Set had 137 meanings. You know, Boolean set of numbers, set of tennis, et cetera, et cetera. But set meaning set your hair, set this. But it was a hundred. It was the word with the most meaning. So I realized that the soft underbelly of the Guinness Book was was language, was words. And so I started working on a um, on a collection of words for drunk. Uh, and I have now gone through about seven or eight collections. In fact, there are people in this room who have actually added to the collection in the last uh, uh, 72 hours. Uh, but we're now up to almost 3,000 words uh, as synonyms for drunk. And what was interesting about it was it, it, it was not to, meant to be a celebration of uh, what is a, a social ill, but it, it, it was to show the, 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 the phenomenal sort of what, English, what the English language is, how many euphemisms, how many different terms we have. And, and what really got to me was looking at all the other people who had collected a list of drunkenness from their time. Uh, Tom Paine, Benjamin Franklin, Ambrose Bierce, uh, Edmund Wilson, Langston Hughes, had all been sort of fascinated by the fact that at their moment in, in history that there were all these euphemisms that were used for drunk. And of course, in doing the book, and I have many, many helpers, some of whom are in this room tonight, um, uh, that, that they go back to Chaucer, they go back to Shakespeare, and a lot of them are unscrambling um, uh, euphemisms in, in Shakespeare, for example, when, when Falstaff comes into the room and is, he said he, the sun was in his eyes, it means he's, he's like coming in like this squinting and that was, so that was the word for drunk. So, so a lot of what I've, I've been fascinated with, I've, I've written a, a, a number of books, but uh, more than a dozen are books about language and they tend to be, they range from the very serious books, like I, I've done a baseball dictionary which has been in three editions and is now about 10,000 entries, which is more than most people want to know about baseball, but um, I, I look upon language as a, as, as, as a recreation, as something, you know, that I guess the term is recreational linguistics, which is the ability to use language as, as, a, as, a, as a, a plaything. That's what drives us to crossword puzzles and Scrabble games and, and things like that, is, is language is, as pleasure, language is recreation. You know, if you're, yell, if you're drowning in Yale health, that's the most you know, efficient use of language, H-E-L-P, but, but beyond that, it's, it, a lot of it's, it's word play, and, and one of the reasons I still, I can, I can wow four-year-olds with knock-knock jokes, because they're based on, on word play. Um, but uh, th this book got me started, uh, and again, I've done a number of books on language. Uh, this one really got me started a while back when I made a sort of, what I thought was an interesting discovery, which is the word Founding fathers, the phrase founding fathers, did not go back to the early days of the Republic, but in fact was created by uh, uh, Warren Gamaliel Harding for the 1920 Front Porch campaign. And he actually used it once in 1918, but it was really his phrase was founding fathers, referring to those people who, uh, who wrote the Constitution and created the country and, and created its, its fundamental uh, set of values and laws. and. Um, before that, and I, and I couldn't, at first I pinched myself, I, I just couldn't get over the fact that there was no earlier use, and I used all the databases, and I actually got uh, somebody at the Legislative Re Reference Service at the Library of Congress to back me up on it, say, can you guys find an earlier example of this? The uh, Library of Congress, uh, at first there was a sort of a like a deep breath saying, oh my God, this guy's nuts. But, but, the, but the idea was, they, nobody could find it. It had been found a little incidentally, like somebody said, the founding fathers of Harvard University or something, but it was never used as a descriptor for the, for, the, for the people who framed the Constitution, and of course framers was earlier. And it, it's interesting also that it really didn't take off um, until 1941 when a book was written called Founding Fathers, but it was immediately adopted 
uh, by, by both, both sides of the aisle, although some of the early uses, when you go back and track, when it starts being used in the 20s more and more often and replacing um, the word uh, framers, it's often used as a negative. The Founding Fathers never meant for us to have pastel-colored postage stamps, or the Founding Fathers never meant for us to help poorer nations in the time of war. It was used as a sort of a, giving the, these, these people the, who framed the Constitution sort of a collective veto on certain things. And it was, it was interesting use of language. And then I got fascinated with Harding, because Harding, Harding's misuse of the language was so intense that, that Warren G. Har I mean, that H. L. Mencken uh, created a term called Gamaliel's, which was a description of how badly uh, Harding m murdered the language. But, but Harding had an interesting ch uh, uh, ability to create words like bloviate, meaning to, what I'm doing right now, to, <laughs> to orate, you know, pompously. Um, but he also, it was also his word, he could picked up an, a very old uh, word that had really no use at all except in chemistry, which was normalcy. Normalcy had existed before in chemistry for a state of normality. But it was, it was during that 1920 front porch campaign, which is another term that came out of the Harding years, uh, that we first heard uh, normalcy, and it was the return to normalcy. And of course, it would immediately everybody threw up their hands, and the, and the, and the language police went crazy and, and, and said this was not really a word or anything. But it gradually has worked its way into the language so that often after there's a major calamity or a major uh, setback in this country, somebody will uh, say that it returned to normalcy, and people don't really bat an eyelash anymore. It's now considered a, a proper word. Um, or not a, if not a proper word, it's a word. I mean, Aaron McKean, the great, uh, probably one of our great lexicographers, said the other day, somebody said something wasn't a word, and she said, no, no, you got it wrong. You don't have to be a pedigree to be a dog. And so that a word is still just not, nothing more than a, a, a unit of communication. Um, but the, so I, I really started looking into this. Did a little, lot of you know, research, a lot of looking into the presidents. And what the, the storyline in this? It's it's an A to Z book, so it's fairly you know you can go and dip in as you see fit. Some of the stuff is funny, some of it's not so funny. But uh, the, re, the what, what really the the nexus of the whole thing is if you look back at the early the, the beginnings of this country and the whole concept of language, and of what this country was. Uh, there's a letter that's written between Benjamin Franklin and Noah Webster, the dictionary maker, in which um, uh, they talk about acts of, of uh, resistance, acts of, of rebellion, acts of uh, re response to the British. And they're talking, they use various words to talk about it, but they're really um, sort of American acts to, to sort of identify who we are as a people. And, the, and, what, and what, what are involved in these acts? One of the acts is uh, public libraries. Benjamin Franklin has come to this country, his father has come to this country smuggling a Bible, smuggling a Bible into a seat of a, of a, of a, of a, uh, of a chair and, and, and tells Benjamin at one point that one of the things, uh, the most important things you can be is a printer. And th this is uh, the idea that when England at that time, when his father came over, when the Franklins came over, that, that in England there were only two printing presses, one in Oxford, one in London. And Franklin uh, was very interested in these, these acts, these, 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 these d definitions of who we were as a people. So when Franklin f creates a free library in Philadelphia, this is seen as an act of resistance, an act of uh, against the British. It's a thumbing of the nose against the British. When Noah Webster goes and, and, and literally crusades for uh, literacy, this is his uh, way of, of not only to sell dictionaries and books that he spelling books and such, but it was also a, what part of his, this, these acts against the British. And um, it, copyright is another. Webster is one of the, the early people with this. And the early presidents uh, and, and are all very much aware of this. Uh, 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 Jefferson probably is the lead, lead in this. Uh, Jefferson creates words with great, great abandon. With he just loves to create words. He loves to, to sort of tuck a a, 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 a jibe at the British by creating words. 1840, much later, and, 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 but he writes, a, I mean, sorry, 1820, he writes a letter to, to John Adams and he says, you know, our duty, our duty as Americans is to neologize. And he creates the word neologize to create new words, create new phrases. So Jefferson is, Jefferson creating all these words and some of them are, are he creates the word Ottoman, not for the empire, but for the footstool. He creates, um, there, there's, I mean, there's just, there's, there are 114 words now 
114 words in the Oxford English Dictionary which are credited to Jefferson either as the